Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, let me thank you for blessing us by taking the time to watch or hear this message. Now, due to the ongoing spread of COVID-19, or as many of you know, it is coronavirus that's been plaguing our nation, we've decided, uh, well, actually, we've had to postpone a church service for a second week in a row. And um, let me tell you, it has been challenging even personally. As you can tell, I haven't even gotten a haircut, um, but we're doing our part to keep others safe, to keep our families safe, and I hope that you are as well. Now, although as a pastor I prefer to teach the Word of God in front of people, I decided to record this message in an empty building to minimize the risk to anyone, for, just to minimize risk for anyone getting sick. By doing this, we're not only complying with the request from our city, state, and national leaders, but we're also doing our part by loving our neighbor. So if you're watching and listening, I hope that you enjoy and are blessed by this message from the safety of and comfort of your home. Now, if you're able to, we also hope that you'll consider blessing us with a small financial contribution of any amount. If you'd like to do that, you can go to the bottom of our website at fvcelp.org, scrolling all the way to the bottom, and you'll see a PayPal button there that you can click on, and it'll direct you uh, to another page where you can donate anything that you want to give. Or, if you're watching on YouTube, there's going to be a link on the bottom of the description area um, below the video. Now, your financial assistance will ensure that we can not only pay the bills here, but also the rent um, in order to keep the doors open when we're able to meet once again. Now, if you have any questions or you have any prayer request, definitely let us know. We want to pray for you. We want to know about you. We want to you know, just let us know anything that, um, that's on your heart or on your mind. And you also, you can do that by um, filling out the contact and prayer request form on our website. Also, you can email us, um, you can call us, and also you can send us a message on our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And again, that information is also on our website. We want you to know that all of us at Fresh Vision Church are praying that God will reveal His will and purpose during this time, and that many more will come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. During this time of uncertainty, I pray for you as well. I pray for you with the exact same words Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 through 20. And there he says, I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height and depth, depth of God's love, and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond, beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you again for watching, and may God bless you. Now with that, we'll begin with this morning's message. Well, this morning we're going to be finishing the 12th chapter of Luke's Gospel, as well as getting into the first nine verses of chapter 13. Now so far in this chapter, the Lord has showed us the kind of attitude we ought to have in the face of persecution. He's warned us about material possessions, not to worry about our basic needs, and to always be ready for His return. This week, 
we're going to be reading about some more matters that he wants us to consider before he comes back. So before we get into God's word, let's ask him to speak to us this morning. Lord Heavenly Father, again we come before you on, in another week of, of uncertainty, Lord. But we know that you are with us, we know that you are protecting us, we know that you have a plan and a purpose behind all this, Lord. And so I ask that you make it known. You make it known to us as your people. You make it known to us individually. Speak to us. Minister to us. May we find the comfort that we're seeking in the shadow of your wings. Lord, so right now I, I pray for those that are sick. I pray for those who are hurting. I pray for those that um, have loved ones that um, may have come down with, with the coronavirus, Lord. And I pray that you will, uh, your hand of protection will be on them, that you will heal them, and that you will comfort them as well, Lord. Bless this message that I'm about to give, Lord. Speak truth. May it come, go out there to whoever is listening powerfully, Lord. And may they hear from you, Lord. Soften hearts, soften minds, Lord. Use me as, as your microphone, as your, as your tool, Lord. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for this day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Last week we left off in verse 48. And we'll be picking up today in verse 49. Luke chapter 12, verse 49. And the Word of God says, I came to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already set ablaze. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how it consumes me until it is finished. Do you think that I came here to bring peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, right away you say a storm is coming, and so it does. And when the south wind is blowing, you say it's going to be hot, and it is. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and sky, but why don't you know how to interpret this present time? Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? As you are going with your adversary to the ruler, make an effort to settle with him on the way. Then he won't drag you before the judge. The judge hand you over to the bailiff, and the bailiff throw you into prison. I tell you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last cent. After explaining to his disciples that having an eternal perspective will require a servant to remain faithful, alert, and vigilant for the master's return, in this section, Jesus informs them about a few other matters they needed to be aware about when he returns. He tells his followers in verses 49 and 50 that they needed to consider the judgment to come. To begin with, he, met, he first mentions the judgment he'd render by bringing fire on the earth. Now, there are a few possible ways to interpret this. One, he could be speaking of the fire of judgment he'd bring at his second coming. Two, he could be speaking of the fire that would that would come from the Holy Spirit after he had accomplished his work on the cross. Or three, he could be speaking of the fire that would occur as the gospel would spread and change lives around the world after his death and resurrection. Now either one of these makes the most sense because the Lord pronounces that how I wish it were already set ablaze. It would be a mistake to look at the statement 
of as uh, look at the statement as as a statement of frustration as if Jesus wanted to get the whole thing over with no rather it should be understood as a statement of dedication to the mission and readiness to complete the task regardless of the cost then in verse 50 he refers to the judgment that he himself would suffer the baptism he mentions he'd have to undergo isn't the same one as the one he experienced with John the Baptist. This baptism comes from betrayers. This is the baptism of death and crucifixion. All the emotional and physical agony he'd have to endure, he adds, is what consumes him until it is finished. This powerful statement here tells us that he had an unyielding determination to make sure that every single aspect of it was completed. Not just out of obedience to the Father, but also because he knew the crucifixion was humanity's only way of salvation. There was no other way. It had to be done. As believers, we ought to have that same unyielding determination to complete the mission that God has called us to. It should consume us. It should be something that we, we have to do. It's, it's a fire that's deep within us. When that fire is set ablaze, nothing will be able to stop it. You may have challenges, yes, along the way, but, well, just like a fire, it just keeps roaring and warring, especially if it's hot. So whatever it is that God calls you to do, don't stop doing it. Keep going. Don't give up. Don't quench that fire. A second matter the disciples needed to know was, a division, was about the division that serving Jesus, serving Him, would bring. The Lord knew that most of them, if not all of them, saw Him as a man who would bring peace on earth by ushering in, ushering in a political messianic kingdom. But here he was bursting that bubble. He was bursting their bubble by telling them that he wasn't there to bring worldwide unity, but rather he'd be the source of worldwide division. Our Lord came to be the dividing line between believer and unbeliever, between those who trusted in him and those who didn't. Specifically, he illustrated how he'd be the cause of division between a family of five. Now, the formula he provided, three verses two and two verses three, is meant to be an example to show what happens when a family member or when family members become a Christian. There are so many stories out there of people who've been disowned, persecuted, even killed by their own family members because they accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. For example, here's one I found. In a biography of a missionary, the author told a story about an Indian law student who became a Christian. He asked the missionary if he could be baptized secretly as, as if, or secretly, then, uh, because if it were done publicly, his, his Hindu father would cut off his allowance and disown him. The missionary insisted that baptism must be done, uh, must be an open confession of faith in Christ or nothing. The student accepted the condition and was duly baptized. His father did cut off his allowance. He had to leave the university and became a clerk instead of a, of a barrister. When the missionary was returning to England, the young man came to see him off at the station. The missionary told him how sorry he was at his conversion, that his conversion meant such a sacrifice. But the young man gripped the missionary's hand and said, but it was worth it. A commentator noted, it's a curious mark of a man's perverted nature that ungodly relatives would often rather have their son a drunkard than have him take a public stand as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
the Lord's point was that dedication and faithfulness would set a person apart from family and friends and would leave no room for neutrality. Every single person will have to choose to be for him or against him. Regardless of the choice though, one should expect strong opposition and separation from friends and family who have decided to make the other choice. Now up to this point, Jesus was primarily speaking to his disciples about their need to consider the judgment to come and the division serving Jesus would bring. However, Luke tells us that Jesus began to speak to the crowds that were there about two more matters regarding his return that they'll need to be aware about. In verses 54 through 56, he used two illustrations everyone knew about to impress on him the importance of discernment, discernment and diligence in spiritual matters. In general, they all pretty much knew that if they saw a cloud rising in the west, that it meant a storm would be coming. And when the south wind was, was blowing, it was going to be hot. So just like the yellow poppies on Trans Mountain tell you that spring has arrived in El Paso, people predicted the weather by looking at the sky and feeling the wind. No one had to tell them these things. They just had the intellect and the will to know it. In spiritual matter, matters, it was different. Although they were smart enough to interpret the weather, they didn't realize the importance of the present time they were living in. God's Son had come to the earth and was standing among them. Heaven had never come so near before, but they didn't know the time of their visitation. The Lord called them hip hypocrites for only using their intellect and will in physical matters, but weren't doing so in spiritual matters. If they had, they would have realized that, that, that only the Messiah could do things that, Je that Jesus did and teach the way Jesus taught. In our present time, there are many reasons to believe Jesus is coming soon, adding to our sense of urgency as we hope to discern this time. Pastor David Guzik made these observations, shared these observations. The stage is set for a rebuilt temple, necessary to fulfill the prophecies of the abomination of de desolation. Since 1948, Israel is a nation again, and hopes of a rebuilt temple continue to rise amongst, amongst a minority of Jews. The stage is set for the sort of world-dominating con confederation of nations heir to the Roman Empire to arise. It will likely be connected to the modern European community, arising out of the goals of their leaders and the chaos of the times. The stage is set for a political and economic world leader to arise, the sort of single political leader who will lead this world-dominating confederation of nations. The stage is set for the kind of false religion the Bible says will characterize the very last days. The stage is set for the kind of economic system predicted for the very last days. That technology is available and the need is present. Now, none of these guarantee that the return of Jesus is soon. It's possible that in the wisdom of God, it may not happen soon. But if that's the case, God would have to allow the same kind of circumstances that mark our present age to assemble again at a later time. In any case, though, the call here is to pay attention to the times we're living in because he could come back at any moment. The other matter the Lord wanted all of them to know about his return was the importance of setting their temporal accounts quickly. The point here appears to be that those who follow 
He mustn't be found fussing over temporal matters when the Lord returns. They should do whatever it takes to avoid spending their last dime or last hour before the Lord returns, dealing with merely temporal concerns. In short, they were to get things settled with earthly judges so that they could prepare to face the heavenly one. Uh, upon closer examination, one can easily see that Jesus is also talking about the urgency of settling accounts with God before he comes back. When speaking of settling with your adversary, there's only one whom all sinners must settle accounts with, none other than God himself. But not only that, he's also the ruler, or as some translations put it, magistrate. He's the judge and the bailiff as well. See, one day everyone who refused to believe in Jesus Christ will be brought before God and stand before him as their judge. There they will be held accountable for every sin they ever committed and settled their account with him. But because they never accepted the free gift of forgiveness while they were alive, the case will be sure to go against them. And as a result, they'll be found guilty, condemned for their unbelief, and will be thrown into prison, that is, eternal punishment. Now, in case you're wondering what our Savior meant by telling them that they will never get out of there until they have paid the last cent, he isn't talking about a person can, that a person can be saved after they've gone to hell. Nor is he talking about paying money to a church in order for that church to bail them out of, of hell. What he's really saying is that it'll, it'll be impossible for anyone to come out of hell. Why? Because no one at all will be able to pay such a tremendous debt. So the fact is this. Very soon, the judge of all the earth will come to judge the earth. And the best way to be ready is to apply these truths to your own personal lives. If you knew a storm was coming, you'd prepare for it. If you knew you'd be taken to court, you'd get a lawyer to try to settle the case out of court. Therefore, you had better settle these things before it's too late. His prison has no parole, and there isn't an early release for time served. Every sentence in his justice system is eternal. Don't be unfaithful, too late, or unwise. Ladies and gentlemen, the storm of God's wrath is coming. And as James 5.9 says, the judge stands at the door. So while you can, while you're alive, use your common sense to settle accounts with God by placing your faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. When you do, He'll place you among the saved to live with Him in heaven rather than among the lost who are, eternal, who are eternally separated from him in hell. Well, as we just read, this chapter ends with the failure of the Jewish nation to discern the time which they lived and with the Lord warning to repent quickly or perish forever. As we begin chapter 13, this general subject resumes. And it's largely addressed to Israel as a nation, although the principles apply to individual people. So let's go there now. Let's go to Luke chapter 13 and read the first nine verses. Luke chapter 13, verse 1. At that time, some people came and reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And he responded to them, Do you think that these Galileans were more sinful than all the other Galileans because they suffered these things? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as well. Or those 18 that, he, that, the, that the Tower of Siloam fell on and killed, 
Do you think they were more sinful than all the other people who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as well. And he told them this parable. A man had a fig tree that was planted in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on it and found none. He told the vineyard worker, listen, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Any, Cut it down. Why should it even waste the soil? But he replied to him, sir, leave it this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. Perhaps it will produce fruit next year. But if not, you can cut it down. So far, we've read about four matters Jesus wanted his followers to consider before he came back, before he comes back. But as we just read, there was more. Here, Jesus explained two more matters that were important to know, important for, for believers to know prior to his return. In the first five verses, he touched on the issue of repentance. More specifically, dedication to God's mission begins with repentance from sin. Luke tells us in verse 1 that Jesus' teaching prompted a few in the, from the crowd to report to him an incident in which Pilate ruthlessly, ruthlessly executed some Galileans, apparently as they were in the act of offering sacrifices. It's believed that the blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices meant that they were killed as they were sacrificing. Now aside from that, we know nothing more about the incident. But it was still fresh in the memory of religious Jews. Now, Jesus didn't take this occasion to take pot shots at Pilate or offer a defense of God in the face of evil or even to propose an explanation of why such tragedies happen. Furthermore, he rejected the idea that the deaths of these unfortunates were because, as many had supposed, they were especially notorious sinners. Instead, Jesus explained they were no more and no less sinful than anyone else, and that no one is exempt from that kind of tragedy. Spurgeon put it this way, It is true, the wicked man sometimes falls dead in the street, but has not the minister fallen dead in the pulpit? Is it true that a, it is true that a pleasure boat in which men are seeking their own pleasure on Sunday has, su has suddenly gone down. But is it not equally true that a ship which contained none but godly men who were bound upon the ex excursion to preach the gospel has gone down too? It happens. It happens whether it's, on a, whether it's on, at the club on a Saturday night or on church on a Sunday morning. People die tragically. He then gave them another example of a horrible incident that occurred, that occurred at the corner of the south and east walls of Jerusalem at the water reservoir called Siloam. There, 18 people died when the tower fell and killed them. His question was, were these the worst sinners in Jerusalem punished for their horrible sin? Now, the obvious answer was no, of course not. The reason he brought it up was to reinforce the point that, hearer, hear, that his hearers shouldn't waste their tr time trying to find meaning to unpredictable tragedies. All around us, even in our time and even in our day and age, there have been so many tragedies. Whether it's school shootings, club shootings, whether it's natural disasters, you name it. There's been so many tragedies that have happened just in our nation alone. And sadly, there are a lot of Christian so-called leaders out there that will say that it's because God, that, that these things are happening because God is, is punishing Americans or that, um, or that those people that were killed at the club were evil and wicked or... I, all kinds of reasons. Again, that's, 
essentially that's what they're doing here was is that they're reading too much into it and saying that it was due to wickedness it was due to evil that these th these tragedies happen the real reason for these tragedies well only god knows and we have to trust that we can't place ourselves in his shoes and judge others we can't we can't do that the bible tells us not to again we shouldn't waste our time trying to find meaning to unpredictable tragedies now in both of these tragedies jesus issues this warning unless you repent you will all likewise perish again he wasn't saying that the deaths of these that the deaths from these incidents were the result of a special judgment for gross wickedness. Rather, he was emphasizing the point that if those unrepentant sinners died like that, then they themselves had better repent. Why? Because all men are sinners. So the question isn't, why did these people die? But am I spiritually ready if death, if death came unexpectedly? and tragically if you haven't yet repented of your sins do so before it's too late James 4 14 says you do not know what tomorrow will bring you are like vapor that appears for a little while then vanishes and then here's what it says in Hebrews 9 27 each person is destined to die once and after that comes judgment so, if life vanishes as, vanishes as quick as vapor, and death comes, and after death comes judgment, you should repent of your sins today, or else perish spiritually for all eternity. The final matter Jesus brings up in this first section of chapter 13 is the importance of being fruitful prior to his arrival. The key point of this parable isn't the, that the owner wanted to cut down the fruitless tree, but rather the advice of the vineyard keeper to wait and give it a chance with some carrying and tending to produce fruit. Jesus' hearers are warned that as of yet, they have no fruit. But the Lord is long-suffering and does more than enough to encourage not only them, but he encourages us to repent and bear fruit although he has every right to cut us down in his mercy he has spared us yet we mustn't presume upon the kindness and long suffering of the Lord for the day of judgment will finally come and anyone without fruit can anticipate only judgment one commentator said this literally the parables ending is open-ended, awaiting an appropriate response by those it represents. The certain man in the parable illustrated the patience of God, of God in judgment. In the parable, that man waited three years, gave it a second chance, didn't leave the tree alone, and cared for it. When God shows special care for someone, it may feel to them like they are surrounded by manure, but he is nourishing and preparing it for fruit bearing to come. Now, William Barclay drew several wise points of application from this. Number one, uselessness invites disaster. Number two, if something only takes, it cannot survive. Number three, God gives second chances. Number four, there is a final chance. As Christians, God will be looking for how fruitful we are when he comes back. See, the fruit of our lives shows what kind of person we really are. An apple tree will bring forth apples, not watermelons. If Jesus has truly touched our life, it will show by the fruit we bear even if it takes a while for that fruit to come forth. So what fruit? 
is God looking for? Well, it certainly has to begin with the fruit of the Spirit mentioned in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. There it says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, yes, there are others, but for, not, but for now, start with these and then answer this question. Does the Lord find fruit on the tree of your life? Or does he walk away empty-handed each time he passes by? Brothers and sisters in Christ, God is seeking fruit. He will accept no substitutes. And the time to repent is now. Repentance isn't something you put on a list of things to do someday. Time is short. Repent now or perish now. God, God's grace has given you another chance. So the next time you hear about, tra uh, about a big tragedy that claims many lives, ask yourself this question. Am I just taking up space? Or am I bearing fruit to God's glory? In these two passages we covered this morning, the Lord presented six matters that everyone needs to consider as we wait for Him to come back. We need to consider the judgment to come, the judgment He'd render with fire and the judgment that He Himself suffered on the cross. We need to know the division that serving Christ will bring. As a Christian, you should expect strong opposition and separation from friends and family who don't agree, who will go against everything that you believe. And it will be hard, especially if you are a new Christian that comes from a different um, religious background or comes from a family of maybe atheists. You will be, you will be shunned. But know this, God knows He cares for you and He will reward you in heaven. Number three, we need to be discerning about the times we're living in. You see, today, we're one day closer to His return than we were yesterday. 1 Peter 4, 7 tells us, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded for prayer. Number four, we need to settle accounts quickly, not just with others, but with God as well. Before he comes back, make every effort to seek forgiveness and to also accept forgiveness. We're told in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving, with, forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. But not only that, never cease from seeking God's forgiveness as well. Let me remind you what it says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Number five, because of the uncertainty of life, sinners need to repent. Everyone has sinned. You can see that in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. All deserve to die. Each person has only one hope in face of personal sin. Each must repent, turn from sin, and turn toward God in obedience and dedication. And sixthly, we need to produce fruit. That is, show evidence of God working in our lives. John Corson said this, the way to bear fruit for the Lord's pleasure is to allow Him to dig and, to dig and dung, to expose sin and, dis and dispel self, 
How does this happen practically? By beginning each day and every project saying, Lord, I need you. I can't do this. My own ability, my own personality is dung. My heart is riddled with sin. Oh, I can produce leaves to impress people, but not fruit to satisfy you. It's only by your mercy and grace that I will have anything of substance or pleasure to offer you. Now, overall, Luke chapter 12 describes Christian dedication in contrast, with, er, in contrast to earthly dedication. The world is dedicated to riches, personal power and influence, safety, individual rights, food and clothing, manipulation and abuse of others, parties and pleasure, freedom from imprisonment and suffering. Christ's kingdom is dedicated to trusting God for all needs, holding God in awe and reverence, witnessing to Christ's salvation, forgiveness, heavenly treasures, bringing in God's rule on earth, caring for the poor, being ready for the return of Christ, and carrying out God's work with wisdom and faithfulness. Luke 12 calls us to decide, to what are you dedicated? How you answer determines how you will experience the last judgment. Are you ready for it? It is coming when you least expect it. So again, will you be ready when that happens? If you're not, let me tell you that you can be. All you've got to do is open the doors of your heart and accept Jesus Christ. Receive Jesus Christ into your heart. Make him the Lord and Savior of your life. The question I want, I want to ask all of you is, are you ready? If he was to come right here, right now, if you were to step outside your house and look up to the sky and see the heavens open up and Christ coming on, a, on, a, on his horse with all his angels in his glory, will you be ready for that moment? If you want to know for sure that you are saved and that you will stand before God innocent, then let me lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Wherever you're at, close your eyes and pray this. Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. I believe you sent your Son to die on the cross for my sins. Confess him now and I open the doors to my heart to Him. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. And now fill me with your Spirit. Fill me with your love, your compassion. Make me new. Help me to live a life dedicated to you. Thank you for sending your son to die for me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that, let us know. Contact us. Reach out to us. We want to hear from you and, and pray for you and lead you into, in, in your next steps of your Christian walk. The Lord has so much more to say to you, so much more to teach you. Don't stop here at this point. So uh, again, go to our website, F-E-C-E-L-P. There you'll find all the contact information and let us know how we can help you, how we can pray for you. Amazing message here from Jesus. He's coming back. He's coming back to, he's coming back soon. You must be ready. What I find interesting about uh, this time that we're living in right now, 
with this coronavirus is that a lot of people are either ignoring it and brushing it off or they're paying too much attention to it and that's all they're focusing in but they're ignoring God they're ignoring the message that God wants to teach the world that God wants to show the world through this all so I urge you if you're a believer if you're a Christian focus on the Lord stop looking around for answers stop looking at around for for protection look God has a plan for your life and it could be to get sick and mean and it may not but you have to put your life in his hands and trust him with it if you're watching this and you're sick I'm sorry but in this time hold on to the Lord embrace him find your comfort in him he will give you the answers you need so at the end of this trial at the end of this time whether it's whether you come out of this 100% recovered and healthy you will give all the glory to God but if you don't and this disease takes your life be at peace knowing that you will be in the comforting arms of Jesus Christ once you close your eyes here once you breathe your last here you will be with Jesus Christ and there there will be no more pain no more hunger no more tears no more everything that you know about this life will cease to exist and you'll be with the Lord for all eternity in joy and in worship and in his company let's pray Heavenly Father we are thankful for all you've done I pray for those watching this message I pray that you will use them Lord in a mighty way to to be your witnesses wherever they're at Lord that you will strengthen them you will encourage them Lord I pray that you will light that fire from the Holy Spirit from your spirit that's in them I hope pray that you will light it bright Lord light it may it burn brightly may it just be hot Lord and and that whatever it is that you have them uh, whatever it is that you have planned for their lives that they will fulfill it Lord passionately may it consume them Lord may they not be content with mediocrity Lord and, and just go all out for you may they be sold out completely sold out to you Lord so now Lord I pray for this upcoming week may your children not walk in fear but in the power and strength of your spirit. We love you and praise you and honor you and glorify you. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen.